Chairman of the Ethics and Society Division of the European Brain Program. Wendy Gallister. Wendy is Professor of Psychology, Emeritus, and former co-director at the Rutgers, Rutgers Center for Cognitive Science. He taught pre previously at the University of Pennsylvania from 1966 to 1989, and at UCLA from 1989 to 2000. He received his BA from Stanford in 1963, and his PhD in psychology from Yale University's in 1966. His research currently focuses on the development of quantitative, highly automated behavioral tests for memory malfunction in genetically manipulated mice, with the long-term goal of using genetic methods to discover the molecular, cellular, and systems mechanism underlying the foundational mechanism of cognition. His other interest includes spatial temporal learning, the theory of associative learning, the theory of action, nonverbal arithmetic in humans and non-humans animals, matching behavior, the perception of probability, and electrical self-stimulation of the brain in the heart. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and the National Academy of Science. He has written several influential books, including The Child Understanding of Number, together with his wife, Rochelle German, The Organization of Action, The Organization of Learning, and Memory and the Computational Brain. Wendy Gallister's idea played an important role in cognitive science and its relation to linguistics. For example, he participated in the dialogue with Noam Chomsky, in the Basque Country, and also in the NIAS workshop on core knowledge, language, and culture in 2012 here in Leiden, organized by Johan Rorik and myself. Can you, everybody hear me? Is it picking up okay on the video? Okay, good. So this is a wonderful, very ambitious uh, synthesis uh, by Jean-Pierre. Um, by my, and my comments will be considerably more focused, but they'll be focused on what I think is largely missing from the synthesis, which is the cognitive science part of it. And I will argue that it is a mistake to allot so little time to the cognitive science part of it because cognitive science will transform neuroscience, that will, kind of, will alter the conceptual foundations of neuroscience in the coming decades. Uh, to do this, I have to fill in a little bit that many of you, of course, are completely familiar with, but a bit of background about the cognitive science framework. The core doctrine of cognitive science is, uh, the, computational, is uh, the computational theory of mind. And in materialist terms, this is the uh, idea, the hypothesis, that the brain, that brains are computing machines. And so in order to understand the brain, in order to connect the molecular level to the cognitive level and to the cultural level, we have to understand computing machines and we have to understand how the fundamental parts of a computing machine are implemented uh, in the brain. And to that end, we, the part that I'll be focusing on is that uh, memory is the most important part, the foundational part of a computing machine. And as I, I'm not going to read these two quotes to you, I assume you can all read uh, as part of your developmental process. Uh, and. Uh, they, I put them up there just to show you that it was evident to the founding fathers of computer science. These are both the theoretical, these were founders of theoretical computer science, but also practical computer science. Both of them were intimately involved in the actual construction of the first computing machines. 
And both of them stressed at considerable length that if you were setting out to build a computing machine, the first thing you had to think about was the memory because the memory was the most important part of the machine. Now, why is the memory the most important part of a computing machine? That's because computation is fundamentally the uh, composition of functions. What memory does is enable the unbounded composition of functions, the temporally unbounded uh, composition of functions, and also the circumstantially unbounded composition of functions. And in doing that, it liberates computation from the tyranny of time. Now, I'm if for those of you who are a little unclear by exactly what I might mean by the composition of functions, I hope it will become clear in what immediately follows. As many of you know, uh, my favorite example of the composition of functions is uh, dead reckoning which is the foundation of uh, navigation in every animal species in which navigation has been studied, down to and most emphatically including uh, the ants, uh, the insects, the ants and the bees. And here's a wonderful, whoa, I'm sorry I was. Okay, I didn't realize that I was out of sync with what was appearing on the screen up up there. Okay, so this is from a recent work of uh, Brudelman. These are tracings of the tracks of the cataglyphous ant, this uh, ant that lives in the salt pans of the Tunisian uh, desert. And uh, let's follow one of these tracks. I call your attention to the scale here, which is 100 uh, meters, right? This ant leaves the nest and is searching all over this incredibly desolate landscape. Checks out this location, nothing there, nothing there. Bingo, it finds something here. Damn it. And makes a beeline, as we would say in English, and it goes uh, straight home. Now, this entire journey we know from a very extensive uh, experiments by uh, many different researchers is. Uh, mediated by the dead reckoning computation, which was also the foundation of human navigation up until the invention of the global positioning system a few decades ago. And dead reckoning is extremely um, simple computation, but it involves the recursive composition of functions. The function in, uh, the key function here is the sum function. What you do in dead reckoning is you pull the vector representing your current position from memory, and you add to that vector the vector representing how far you've just moved, how far north and how far east you've just moved, and that generates an updated current position vector which goes into memory, and so that uh, the next time you make a move, you can pull, you can, <laughs> Uh, you can pull that uh, from memory and feed it back into the addition function. So this is the composition of functions. The composition of functions is taking the output of one function and feeding it into either another function or the same function. And memory is used to hold the output and the input, in effect to couple the output to the input over indefinite periods of time. Dead reckoning is the foundation for the construction of the cognitive map. And while it used to be controversial that there was such a thing as a con uh, cognitive map, it's now very widely accepted both in the cognitive and in the neuroscience community that the cognitive map is uh, ubiquitous and is a foundation of uh, many aspects of our behavior. And to see, again, that the cognitive map is all about the composition of functions and that this depends upon memory. I've sketched here what goes on and I hope this doesn't constantly switch the picture on me. Here's an ant. Yeah, just a second, I get rid of that. And uh, we know from ingenious experiments shortening the legs and lengthening the legs of ants that ants uh, measure distances in paces uh, just like Romans. And uh, an ant pace is approximately one millimeter. So a kilo pace is uh, one meter. And we can assume 
that these ants are measuring, or I will assume for the sake of concreteness, that these ants are measuring distances in kilopaces. So he, here we have this ant. Uh, I'm not going to try to point because that's causing all kinds of mischief, but the ant is 90 kilopaces north of uh, where it started its journey, presumably at the nest, and 20 kilopaces east. And it's heading 45 degrees uh, away. It's uh, 45 degrees. Its heading is 45 degrees, and it sees a landmark here. Three things happen, right? The ant ent it makes a copy of its position vector and puts that copy in memory, right? That copy now represents the location at which it had this view. It makes a copy of its heading because we know from experimental work that these snapshots that they store in memory are compass oriented. That is, they're just like what you see in a pilot book uh, if you're a sailor. It says, okay, this is what the entrance of this harbor looks like when you're uh, one nautical mile southeast uh, of the entrance. Right? So it's a compass oriented view. So in making those, those are three functions that each produce an entry to memory. And of course, this is an organized entry, so it uh, constitutes a data structure. Right? And the cognitive map is just a whole bunch of that. Right? You record all the landmarks, all the food sources. You have their locations. You have what the views look like. When you've done that, you have a map. And we know that the cognitive map is essential not only to the animal's uh, ability to navigate, but it's essential to the firing of the neurons in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, right? That is, the, we have these neurons that fire only when the animal's at a certain location, right? They couldn't fire if they didn't have a chart. <laughs> you take away the chart, there is no such thing as a location. There are other neurons that fire in, uh, when the head is pointing in a certain direction, that is, when the animal has a certain heading. Again, you take away the chart, there's no such thing as a direction. The chart is not, uh, direction is not defined by reference to the environment. Direction is defined by reference to the chart. So the chart is fundamental both to the behavior and the neurobiology, but where is the chart? I have been pressing my neuroscience friends with that question for a long time, and they're very reluctant to answer it. They say, well, it's out there in lots of synapses. And I say, well, can you tell me something more about this cloud of synapses that contains the chart? Uh, continuing on the theme of the fundamental role of composition of functions, let's look at the utilization of, uh, of the, the cognitive map. And for that, I draw on this wonderful experiment from Randolph Menzel and his group. I'm getting thirsty. Let me get some water here. So these are with honeybees. And uh, they, I'm going to stand up because if I try to use the pointer there, I'll keep screwing things up. So they've got two platoons of honeybees, one of whom, the one on the right, is coming and going between the hive, the hive is down here, and the table labeled FT there. And a second platoon of bees, these are individually identified bees, they've got little yellow jerseys, if you like, on the <laughs> with numbers uh, on their back. You've got a second platoon of bees that are foraging at uh, the table labeled FD. And they've got, the bees come back to the hive, which is vertically oriented, like most natural hives, and in total darkness. But there's an infrared light inside the hive and a video camera. So they're videoing the dances of the returning foragers. And as I think most of you know, von Frisch won the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that the returning forager does a uh, dance that tells the other foragers where the food source is from which it is returning. So by watching the video, they, know, they now being Menzel's group, that the bees in this platoon have observed the dance of the bees in that plat uh, platoon. So these bees know about the FT location from direct personal experience and they know about that location by hearsay. Right? And uh, then the day after these bees have observed the dance of those bees, when these bees arrive at that table, there's no nectar there. 
and they fly around, they're in and out, they can't believe it, there's nothing. Eventually, some of them just go back to the hive, but some of them do what you see here. Uh, and one of them, the red one here, uh, set a course basically directly from this location, which it knew about firsthand, to that location, which it knew about from information gained under completely different circumstances one day ago, right? That is, the information that made that possible was observing the waggle dance of this bee inside the hive a day ago in total darkness. And now the information is being used a day later under totally different circumstances out there in the open air in order to set that course. This other bee is, in some ways, even more interesting. It started to go home, but at a certain point, it changed its mind. Right? It was an, an arbitrary place in the environment at that point, right? And, but it, when it changed its mind, it said, you know, no, I think I'll go visit this place I've been told about. And notice that it can set a course from this arbitrary location in its environment to this place that it's been told about. <laughs> Now, what I love about navigation is there's no computational mystery here. We know what, a, what this story looks like. And we know that basically any story about this is going to look more or less like this. And it's all the composition of functions. So what do you have to do to do that? Well. You need a memory where you've uh, retained the information, right? And you need to pull the vector that represents the FD location. That's the vector that you got by observing the dance. Are you picking this up OK? In the OK. Uh, you've got to pull that vector from memory. You've got to pull your current position from memory. That's the second vector. You feed those two vectors to the subtraction function, and you get another vector, the difference vector. Right? The difference vector represents how far to the east or west the location you want to go to is from the location where you are, and similarly, how far to the north or south. Right? Now, that Cartesian representation of the difference in location doesn't enable, it doesn't tell you what compass course should I set, right? It doesn't give you your bearing. And it doesn't directly tell you how far it is you have to go. So you have to feed that output from that function to another function, the Cartesian to polar conversion function, which most of you learned about in secondary school, though you may have forgotten it. And uh, that gives you the polar representation, which is the one that you need in order to have your, your, the range and bearing, right? The bearing tells you what your compass should read when you start flying, and the range tells you how far you should fly when you just start looking for, the, uh, for your goal. So this is all, again, I hope, if you weren't clear before what I meant by the composition of functions, this is what I mean by the composition of functions. And what I'm calling your attention to is the fundamental role that the memory plays in this, that it allows the unbounded composition of functions. Now, that brings me to neuroscientists and memory. So I'm now going to argue the following very non-controversial proposition, namely that neuroscientists, when they, so as I think most of you know, looking for the engram is a huge enterprise in neuroscience. Many of the best neuroscientists are engaged in this enterprise, and this has been true uh, for more than a century. It was already a huge topic when I was an undergraduate. And I've been thinking about it all these years. And what I've concluded is that neuroscientists are looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place, guided by an erroneous conception of what memory is. And again, to explain this crazy view, I have to remind you of some of the basics of computation, namely the two fundamental parts of a computing machine. And they are, as you see in this diagram, the processor. Right? What does the processor do? The processor is where the functions reside. The machinery that implements the functions is in the processor. Right? So you, 
got the machinery that does the addition, the machinery that does the ordering operation, the concatenation, the copying operation. Notice the fundamental role that copying plays in the construction of the cognitive map. The machinery that does the photographing, because right, we know that they've got some sort of photograph or encoding of these uh, landmarks. That, that's one part of it, and that's the processing part. This is, of course, Turing's mathematical analysis of computing machines that I'm laying bare for you. And then we have the memory part. Right? And the memory is uh, where the functions get their inputs and where they put their outputs. It's the tape in Turing's analysis and in a conventional computing machine, it's the random access memory or the RAM. Now, a Turing machine that cannot read what it has written to the tape is the mathematical definition of a finite state machine. Right? And neuroscientists, most of them, believe that while the brain computes, it doesn't compute the way a computer computes. And the reason they believe that is because they don't think it has a memory. And if you take a computing machine and you strip away its memory, what you've got is a finite state machine. Right? So it's a machine that can no longer compose its function. Most neuroscientists, think that the brain is a finite state machine that rewires itself, that is, it changes the function executing mechanisms as a result of experience. I have no quarrel with the idea that experience rewires the brain, changes the thing. But that is not what memory is about, because that does not enable the composition of functions. So when I say that they're searching for the wrong thing guided by an erroneous conception, I mean just what I'm laying out here. They think they're looking for a mechanism that rewires the transition table, when in fact they should be looking for a mechanism that serves as the repository for the facts that the animal has gleaned from experience. And sometimes when I say this, it seems that anyone who's been in this game for five years knows that what I just said is true, but sometimes people say, no, no, that's not what we think memory is. Well, uh, again, I won't read you these quotes, but uh, the top one comes from uh, 2016 publication by a, whole, a lengthy and very distinguished list of authors, basically almost all the major players at the molecular level search for the engram. And they all take it absolutely for granted that what they're looking for are plastic synapses, as the quote makes case clear. And I think most of this uh, audience is francophone, so you won't have any trouble with the uh, second quote. And what you see is there's nothing new here in at 2016, because Jean-Pierre was already saying the same thing in 1983 in L'Amne Ronal. And in fact, he, he takes, in this quote, he takes this involvement of synapses in memory is essentially definitional. And he says, because we basically know that the synapses are essential in, in memory, it cannot be the case that memory rests on polynucleotides, which is exactly the hypothesis that I'm headed toward, as uh, some of you may have begun to suspect. Um, so you see that this idea has been with us a long time. And in fact, even in 1983, as I'm sure Jean-Pierre was a well aware, this was not a new idea. This was not a new idea in 1900. As soon as neuroscientists discovered the synapse, they began suggesting that memory was plastic synapses. Cajal suggested it. There are three or four other neuroscientists who had made the same suggestion before the turn of the previous century, that is, before 1900. So this is a very long-standing idea. And it's wrong. Synapses aren't symbols. Right. Again, <laughs> I sometimes get arguments about this, and I'm very puzzled because I, I say, look, you want a paradigm. Some people say, well, what's a symbol? I said, look, we don't have to get into this kind of metaphysical deep water here. Right? Numbers are synapses, right? And I mean numbers the way a computer scientist means numbers. The things, that, you know, I mean bit patterns, right? I mean numerals, if you like physically realized sim 
symbols that refer to quantities, quantities obtained from experience. So I've been asking my numerous neuroscience friends for some years now, how do you write numbers into plastic synapses? And uh, they're very reluctant to answer. Uh, most of them will dodge the question. Uh, I gave a version of this talk at Harvard uh, some years back now with John Lisman as a discussant, and I twice got him to try to say how it is that uh, you uh, write numbers into synapses, and he ducked both times. The second time, the audience began to laugh because <laughs> I, it was I had thrown down the glove, and I said, John, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Here's a fundamental question, and he was not willing to venture an answer. Forget about defending an answer. He wasn't willing to offer an answer. And in the rare cases where you can get them to actually suggest an answer, if you then go on and say, oh, okay, so you're going to write uh, a number into these 10 synapses, and you've written another number into those 11 synapses, and now I want to add the two numbers, right? Because this is a fundamental function. So how is that going to work? Uh, we're going to pull this number from this synapse, pull another number from those synapses together, and what, are we going to write it into 23 synapses? What, where, what are you going to do with this number once uh, we've computed it? I sometimes get people to rise to the first bait. They never rise to the second bait. Uh, so there's no story here. Right? That's why I say that the synaptic theory of memory isn't wrong, it's not even wrong. In order to offer a wrong answer to a question, you have to actually offer an answer. If you haven't answered the question, then you haven't offered a wrong answer, you haven't offered any answer at all. All right, so now that brings me to where we ought to look. Right? As I said, we're looking in the wrong place. So where should we be looking? And now we switch into a different uh, background you need to know something about uh, eye blink conditioning, which is the simplest form, or one of the simplest forms of associative learning. Uh, in eye blink conditioning, there's a CS stimulus, uh, that's for condition stimulus, which might be uh, the onset of a sound or the, ons or the tickling of the back of the paw or hand. And that stimulus warns after a certain latency that there will be a second stimulus, the U.S. or unconditioned stimulus. And the, uh, uh, if you repeat this sound, this stimulus, and then that, that stimulus on several occasions, the animal begins to respond to the warning stimulus in terms of what it, reward, uh, it warns of. Namely, the animal begins to blink at the onset of the tone so as to protect its eye from the threatening stimulus that it knows will follow. Now, the single most important thing about this well-established experimental fact is often not emphasized in secondary textbooks that describe this phenomenon. The rabbit does not simply blink. The rabbit blinks at the right time. So the, if you have conditioned with a 150 millisecond interval between the onset of the tone and the puff to the eye, then the, animal, the rabbit blinks such that the eye is closed at 150 milliseconds. Right? If instead you condition with 300 milliseconds between the onset of the CS and the US, the animal delays its blink so that the eye is maximally closed at 300 milliseconds. Exactly the same thing was true of Pavlov's dog with the salivation. Pavlov varied the interval between the ringing of the bell and the presentation of food over a matter of a few seconds to up to several minutes. You'll be glad to know that when it was 15 minutes, the dog did not drool for 15 uh, minutes. The, the dog only began to draw, uh, drool after nine or 10 uh, minutes. So in all of these simple associative learning paradigms, the animal learns the interval and the interval, the CSUS interval. And this is what I mean by simple quantitative facts that go into memory. So that's the behavioral background that you need to know. Now we come to the neuroscience part of it. It's been known now for several decades that you can forget about the hippocampus, the cortex, and in fact you can forget about the forebrain altogether 
uh, eye blink conditioning is very nicely obtained in the decerebrate animal. The decerebrate animal, you've gone in with a spatula and you've transected the neuraxis between the midbrain and the forebrain so that the, f the entire forebrain is completely out of play here. We're just concerned with med midbrain uh, mechanisms. And moreover, a whole body of work that followed on that very important discovery has shown that the cerebellum, which is sort of the cortex of the uh, midbrain, uh, is fundamental to this phenomena, and more particularly the Purkinje cell in the cerebellar cortex, which is the one of the largest neurons in the brain and also the only output from the uh, cerebellar cortex, is fundamental. And that's the background to the experiment by Frederick Johansson in Jerry Heslow's lab. Jerry was supposed to be here, but he's in bed with the flu, lamentably. Um, and uh, I tried to get Frederick to come, but Frederick is too busy in London. Anyway, so I'm going to have to tell you about their experiment uh, all by myself. I was a reviewer of this, and I told science this was the most important paper in the neurobiology of memory that had appeared in my lifetime. So, of course, science rejected the uh, article. Shows you how much clout I have with science. Anyway... Okay, I'm going to start the point here, but the machine is going to betray me. Uh, it's a fact of modern life here. Okay, so now the trouble is that it keeps interpreting my finger as a command to change the slide. Anyway, when all I try to do is point, right? Okay, so in the essence of this experiment is that Frederick Johansson uh, did what every neurobiologist dreams of doing, namely get rid of as much of the animal as possible. This has what, been what neuroscience has been about uh, since Dubois, Raymond, and Helmholtz and the nerve muscle preparation in the middle of the 19th century. So we want to uh, produce the CS directly. <laughs> I'm going to have to. If you look up there, you see the CS electrode, right? He's placed an electrode on the parallel fibers. The Purkinje cell is that enormous cell with a huge flat dendritic tree, and the parallel fibers is a huge bundle of 200,000 fibers for each uh, individual Purkinje cell. Uh, that, a bit going fast here, so I'm distorting things a bit. But they provide the CS signal. What previous research had established was that in this eye blink conditioning uh, phenomenon, the signal generated by the warning stimulus in eye blink conditioning arrives at the Purkinje cell by way of the parallel fibers. Everybody clear about that? And so Frederick has placed an electrode on the parallel fibers. So now he controls the signal that is seen by the Purkinje cell. Right? It's no longer a guess what the signal is that is seen by the Purkinje cell. We know what it is because Frederick is directly producing that signal by stimulating the bundle of uh, parallel fibers. Right? Similarly, we know that the US signal, the signal from the, the puff to the eye or the shock, uh, arrives by a climbing fiber, and Frederick has placed another stimulating electrode on the climbing fiber. So now he's directly conditioning the Purkinje cell itself. He's gotten rid of everything else, right? The CS is electrical stimulation of the parallel fibers. The US is stimulation of the um, climbing fiber. And now he runs Pavlov's paradigm, right? He turns on the stimulation of the parallel fibers. He's going to keep stimulating them for 800 milliseconds. That's fairly important. Keep that in mind. Much longer than the CSUS interval. That's, that's what's important about this. In other words, the termination of the CS stimulation is not coincident with the US stimulation in this paradigm, right? It the CS stimulation goes on for hundreds of milliseconds after the delivery of the US signal. So on each trial, he turns on this stimulation of the parallel fibers, and at some fixed interval that varies from one cell to the next, each time he repeats the experiment, he uses a different CSUS interval, 
So let's say at 150 milliseconds after the onset of the CS stimulation, he delivers the US stimulation. When he first does this, the first few trials, the CS stimulation of the parallel fibers either has no observable effect on the firing of the Purkinje cells. I realize at this point that I've left out a crucial fact. <laughs> the crucial fact that I've left out is that the Purkinje cells have a very high spontaneous rate of firing. So the Purkinje cells are firing at 80 to 100 hertz, 80 to 100 spikes per second, spontaneously. And in the course of conditioning, I left this out of the background, and it's one of the most important facts. The, uh, in the course of conditioning, we already knew before Frederick ran this experiment that as, at the point where the blink appears in the behavior, you observe a pause in the spontaneous firing of the Purkinje cell. And that the pause, the duration of this pause in the spontaneous firing, shows the same temporal parameters as the behavior. That is, the, the, if the eye blink latency is 150 milliseconds, then what you see at the Purkinje cell is very soon after the onset of the CS stimulation, it stops its uh, spontaneous firing. And it resumes its spontaneous firing uh, at approximately 150 milliseconds, at approximately the time when the US is anticipated and the time at which the eye blink will actually occur. OK. So what Frederick observes in this experiment is exactly that. Right? Only it's, the important thing is now, Unlike all the previous experiments, we know what the signal is that's coming in from the parallel fibers. Up until now, we were guessing. And most of the theoretical nonsense that was being put out there hinged on guesses about what was coming in on the parallel fibers. But now we know what's coming in on the parallel fibers. And that input signal has no information whatsoever about the CSUS interval. Now, on the, we know that because we control that signal. And um, now, once the, you, the conditioned blink has appeared, as in Pavlov's experiments, once the conditioned response has appeared, he r removes the US. Right? So the US is no longer being presented. But you're still seeing the conditioned response. And it still has an appropriate time. And exactly the same thing is true with the this conditioned pause in the firing rate of the Purkinje cell. Um, and here are two examples uh, of this. Uh, these are raster plots. I think most of you are familiar with them. Each line in one of these plots is one of these trials. And the little, almost barely visible dots are the spikes. They mark the times at which the spike. Remember, this is from the electrode that's recording the firing of the Purkinje cell. And uh, so wherever there are no dots, there's no firing. Uh, that's, uh, that's the pause. Right? And uh, there are 20 trials in uh, each of these records. And the green asterisks uh, mark uh, the estimated onset of the pauses, as calculated by an algorithm that I've developed. And the red asterisks uh, represent the uh, offsets of the pauses. This enables us to do statistics on a trial-by-trial trial basis uh, here. And on the left, the cell was trained with 150 milliseconds. And the blue line, the first blue vertical blue line shows you the onset of the CS. And the second vertical blue line shows you when the US would have occurred during training. But I remind you, there is no US here. Right? The second thing I remind you of is that the CS stimulation is continuing well beyond the, uh, the, the red asterisks, right? The, the termination of the pause cannot be explained by termination of the CS stimulation, because the CS stimulation continues for hundreds of milliseconds uh, after that. That's a really crucial point that I hope everybody grasps. Now, if you look over in the second record, you see uh, an animal, a cell, <laughs> no longer an animal, but a single cell, trained with a 300 millisecond uh, 
interval, and as you see, now the duration of the pause is twice as long as it was with the 150 millisecond thing. So the, this single cell has internalized the CS-US interval. There's an engram here, folks, <laughs> and it isn't in the synapse, at least as the synapse has been traditionally conceived. Because the synapses do not insert pauses, right? That's not what synapses do. What synapses do is what Jean-Pierre was uh, describing. They relay signals from one neuron to the next. Okay. Another very important thing that Frederick did in this experiment was once he had this condition pause, he manipulated the CS stimulation. So he said, do, I've already stressed the fact that the information isn't in that signal, but what if we vary that signal all over the place? What if instead of stimulating the parallel fibers at 50 pulses per second for 800 milliseconds, what if we stimulate them for 17 and a half milliseconds? So we've shortened it by more than an order, or by almost an order of magnitude. Now the CS is much shorter than the CS-US interval. And we stimulate it 500 hertz, 500 pulses per second. So this is a radically different input. You get exactly the same pause. Okay? You can't tell what the CS stimulation parameters are from looking at the pause. So all the input from the parallel fibers is doing is triggering the reading of the engram. And the engram must be inside the neuron. So this is by my lights. This is why I thought this was the most important uh, paper published in my lifetime. It told us where to work. And I'm still trying to convince Thomas <laughs> and Jean-Pierre and all my molecular biology friends that this is where they should be looking. I have been looking for that. <laughs> huh? I have been looking for that since time to go. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear it. Because as I'm now going to tell you, and as your talk pointed out, let, if I were to summarize what Jean-Pierre showed over the course of his uh, very distinguished career with allosteric uh, uh, binding, is, is what's sort of been the lesson from molecular biology in my lifetime. And this, and this literally, no one understood this when I was young. <laughs> and, and until Watson and Craig, no one began to grasp what was actually going on at the molecular level. And particularly, they didn't understand that at the molecular level, we have all these very complicated machines that have multiple moving parts and that do very complicated things uh, in response to very complex sets of signals. Right? That has been the lesson from molecular biology in my lifetime, and John Bier made a very important contribution to that, uh, that general lesson. So once we start looking at the molecular level, what are we looking for? Well, the first thing we're looking for is a memory. There has to be a structure of some kind that can carry information forward in time in computationally accessible form. Is there such a structure at the molecular level? How many molecular biologists are there in this audience? You don't have to know very much molecular biology and to know that there's a bloody obvious answer to that question. Yes, indeed, Virginia, there are molecules that have exactly those properties uh, inside not only neurons but every cell. They're called polynucleotides. DNA and RNA, and RNA are polynucleotides. They are strings of nucleotides. And they were built to carry genetic information from generation to generation. We know that as a fact, as an undisputed fact, that the function of these molecules is to carry information. And we know how to write information into those molecules, any kind of information. I gave a talk a few months ago of this general nature, and the person who introduced me showed a video every frame of which had been passed through bacterial DNA. That is, the value for every pixel in every frame had been written into bacterial DNA and then read back out of it in order to feed that, uh, that information to the projector. Okay, so polynucleotides, they can carry information. They are truly awesome information 
carriers. That's why many labs are investigating using bacterial DNA as the memory in a conventional computer. The second thing that is perhaps less known to non-molecular biologists, but again is intimately tied to Jean-Pierre's history, is that genes have, DNA has two parts. It has a coding part and it has an address part. The address part is what Jacob and Monod discovered. That's the operon. And because it has, those are exactly the same two parts that you find in random access memory. I put up a diagram here of random access memory. And every horizontal line in this represents a register in RAM. Again, I'm sure many of you know this, but I discover not everybody knows this kind of stuff. Um, and the coding, every time the computer writes a bit pattern to memory, it each intersection between a vertical line and a horizontal line is a, is a bit, a little switch. Uh, molecules make excellent switches. Uh, and you throw that switch one way to represent zero, and you throw that switch another way to represent one. And a bank of those switches constitutes a register in memory. Right? So that's the coding part of a random access memory. And the other part is the address part. Right? Because you have to write a bit pattern into a certain place. That's the address. How do you do that? You put a, every, loca every one of those registers has a numerical address. And when the computer wants to write a bit pattern to a particular location, it puts the bit pattern that represents the address on the address bus. That selects that location. Then it sends in the bit pattern that it wants to write and the write pulse. And that flips all the switches in that row. And that's how it writes. When it wants to read, it has to know the address. If it doesn't, when your disk crashes, the problem is it no longer knows the addresses. Right? So if it doesn't know the addresses, it can't read the information even though it's all there. When it wants to read something, it has to know the address. It puts the bit pattern for the address on the memory. That selects the row that contains the information it wants to read. It then pulses the uh, read pulse, and the bit pattern from that row comes out. Right. So. This is addressable memory in the random access. And what I'm calling your attention to is the fact that this looks just like the genetic story, except that the genetic story is more complicated and more intricate. That is, the operon, is, there's been a huge story about the operon, and uh, we could have a all year long seminar about the intricacies of uh, operon um, reading and uh, so on, everything that has followed from uh, the discovery of Jacob and uh, Monod. Um, but the basic idea is, look, there's an address of each gene, and when the cell needs the information in that gene, it synthesizes a transcription factor, which uh, uh, Jean-Pierre has already described, and that transcription factor binds to the operon for that uh, gene, and that turns on the reading, the transcription of that gene. Right? So not only do we find information carrying molecules, but they have just the two-part structure that any computer scientist would tell you is exactly what we're looking for. Because this addressing is hugely important. But outside of computer science, very few people understand why it's important. The addressing, this ability to address a bit of information, to access it by its address, not by its contents, is what makes possible variable binding. And for those of you who read in the connectionist literature, one of the dirty little secrets is that the connectionists have never solved the variable binding problem. And basically, if you can't do variable binding, you're not a serious, uh, you're not playing in a serious compu uh, computational game, because variable binding is the whole secret to the construction of hierarchical databases. And hierarchical databases are what give computers their power. And of course, it's the same story in genes. The genes also use, the reading of genes also uses indirect uh, addressing. And that's what makes the genetic record a hierarchically structured system. And it's because it's a hierarchically structured system that you can have a gene for an eye. 
When I was an undergraduate, they told us that having a gene for an eye was impossible because an eye was a complicated trait. And I wondered, Jesus, if that's impossible, how do we have eyes? Um, so when I was an undergraduate, very few people understood how computers work, and they lacked the conceptual resources to understand what a hierarchical database was about, and therefore they re lacked the uh, conceptual resources to understand how it was possible <coughs> to have a gene for an eye. But now, as I think most of you know, we do have genes for an eye, right? The Germans won the Nobel Prize for finding this gene, which you, you turn it on on any part of the fly's body and you get an eye on that, the abdomen, the antenna, the elbow. Wherever you turn that gene on, you get an eye. And in fact, there's an almost exact homologue of that gene in the human being. And you can take the eye gene out of a human being, stick it into a fly, and turn it on, and you get an eye. Now, what kind of eye do you get? <laughs> a fly eye, right? <laughs> this is the distinction between a variable and its value, right? <laughs> the eye is the variable, and the value here is the actual result. And the value of the eye variable in the fly is profoundly different from its value in the... But they're both labeled by the same uh, symbol uh, uh, because of evolution. Okay, so... I'm nearly done here. The, uh, all right, so we've got the memory. We've got the most important part. And what I'm trying to get the molecular biologists to realize is that's the low-hanging fruit. Given Frederick's experiment, I'm sure if I could get 10% of the molecular biology co community to grasp how important that experiment is, we would know the physical basis of memory before I die, which I... <laughs> Not sure that's going to otherwise happen. Because that's the low-hanging fruit. We're looking for something fairly simple. We know exactly where to look. There's more to Frederick's story than I've told you, but we can go over that in the discussion. But it tells you even more about what you need to know to set out on the biochemical quest. And so now we come to the second part. Well, if the memory is inside the cell at the molecular level, then any computer scientist would tell you, well, you better put the computing machinery in there too because the most important thing that goes on in a computing machine is this traffic back and forth between the memory and the, and the machines that are doing the crunching of the information in the memory. And the whole design of computers is to put those things as close as you possibly can together. And as Jean-Pierre was pointing out, the nervous system is a hell of a lot slower than a computer, so that must be even more important in uh, the brain that it is in a computer, given how much slower uh, uh, signal transmission is in a computer, in a brain than it is in a computer, a point with which I profoundly agree. So the question then is, are there, is there computational machinery inside these cells implemented at the molecular level? And again, the answer is, oh yes, for sure. Computational machinery is built out of logic gates. And uh, that is there, if you want to know how ad addition actually works in a computer, you s I have a diagram in one of my publications that shows you the five logic gates that you have to uh, wire together in order to get something that uh, adds zero and one in the uh, correct way. And that is a diagram, that, that's the diagram on which Intel uh, the entire Intel uh, operation rests uh, because that's the, the key component in the sequence of logic gates that implements addition, which is, of course, one of the most fundamental functions in a computing machine. P second, perhaps, only to copying. Uh, anyway, uh, AND gates are implemented uh, and all the logic gates are implemented uh, by the chemical machinery that reads uh, the genetic code. So we've got everything we need there at the molecular level uh, inside the cell, including, of course, copying. I couldn't resist putting this famous sentence up, up here. This, this is the final sentence from Watson and Crick, 1953. Uh, and you have to understand that prior to the discovery of the structure of DNA, how you could have a gene that made a copy of itself was a total mystery. It was such a mystery that many biochemists didn't think there actually were genes. 
They thought genes were the kind of thing that, you know, fuzzy-headed geneticists uh, thought might be there, but a really hard-thinking biochemist would realize that there couldn't be such a thing as a chemical that made a copy of itself. Well, of course, any idiot, when you looked at the base pairing scheme in, uh, uh, in the Watson and Crick uh, structure, <laughs> no, so it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a copying mechanism, right? So my point is that not only do these molecules carry information, but can you make copies of them? Oh, yes, you can. Uh, is there ma uh, machinery there that does the copying? Oh, yes, there is, right? So since copying is itself an incredibly important operation, it's wonderful to follow, find it there. How copying works if numbers are represented at the synaptic level or at the cell assembly level, I leave, will you ask your nearest neuroscientist how that works? Okay, final point, second to final point. Also one of Jean-Pierre's points. It's almost impossible for the average person to grasp how much smaller the molecular level is than the cellular level. I mean, cells, after all, are already very smell, small. Right? Some of the granule cells you can barely see under the light uh, microscope, right? So it's hard to imagine that there's something many, many orders of, mo uh, of magnitude smaller. But that's, in fact, what there is, right? So if you ask how small is DNA, right? Keep in mind, you can write information in uh, DNA. You say, well, how much space, how much volume is occupied by DNA compared to what's occupied by a two-neuron circuit, which is the smallest possible cell assembly, right? The answer is that DNA is, ten, is 15 orders of magnitude smaller than a very small neural circuit, right? That's 15 zeros before you get to the first synapti uh, significant digit, right? Uh, Feynman, in a famous lecture, brought this out. His, his title of the lecture was, There's Plenty of Information at the Bottom. Right? And that's because the bottom is so small. And you have got all these tiny little machines, and they can do wonderful things. And they can do it at a fraction of the energy cost. So there are circuit level models of dead reckoning, several of them. And all of them use reverberating loops to maintain the position vector. In other words, they have spikes circulating in loops. And you've got what they're called moving bump models. Because you have a little, if you make a diagram of where the activity is, the, the activity in the net moves around. And where the activity is represents where the animal is in the world. And the activity is the firing of spikes. So you can ask, well, how many spikes per second are being fired in these models uh, in order just to keep the record of where the animal is? And the answer is about 4,000 spikes per second in, in these models. And then you can go to Simon Laughlin's work and you can say, whoa, spikes are energetically expensive. How, how, much, how many ATPs do you have to burn in order to fire one spike? And the answer is almost 10 to the ninth ATPs per spike. So if you do 4,000 times 10 to the ninth, you get that's uh, 10 to the 13th spikes per second, uh, 10 to the 13th ATPs per second being used just to keep track of where you are. Now, if you were keeping track of where you are by synthesizing polynucleotide strings, the energy cost of maintaining the strings is essentially zero. So the energy saving is 13 orders of magnitude. And again, I can't resist just to show I'm not alone in making these points. A uh, quote from this wonderful book by Peter Sterling and uh, Simon Laughlin, Principles of Neural Design. These advantages, which Jean-Pierre was himself stressing at a certain point, these advantages of molecular computation Compactness, energy efficiency, and ability to adapt and match all suggest the principle of compute with chemistry. It is cheaper. <laughs> I would only add, yes, much, much cheaper, almost Im unimaginably cheaper. So that leads, of course, to a trivially obvious Darwinian argument. If all the pieces we need to do computation are known to be present at the molecular level inside cells, and if there is serious experimental evidence that the engram is actually inside the cells, 
then why, if you think that that's not where computation is actually going on, if you think it's really all being done at the circuit level, then it seems to me you're under some obligation to believe why not, uh, natural selection hasn't discovered in the course of the past billion years that what's being done at this extravagant waste of space and energy at the circuit level could be done much quicker at much less energetic cost in much less space inside the neuron. Right. Does natural selection not apply to the brain? That's the kind of finishing uh, challenge that is out there. So in a sort of grand summary, what kind of conceptual scheme am I laying out here? What I'm saying is that the brain has the architecture of the internet. The computation in the internet doesn't go on in the signal transfer between computers. Computation goes on in the inside the individual computers, which in my story are the individual neurons. Signal transmission is entirely a matter of memory updating between the different nodes uh, in the internet. The reason the internet is so robust is because the information is duplicated all over the place, right? You're <laughs> your dirty pictures are on some computer in China and another one in Australia and, and uh, what not, right? I mean, <laughs> so that's why your traces on the internet can never be obliterated, right? <laughs> because they're everywhere. So the internet looks just like Lashley's rat, right? No matter where Lashley bombed the cortex of the rat, he could never wipe out the engram. Why on this story? Well, because the engram is spread all over the place. It's duplicated any number of times inside the neurons. On this story, the reason the place cells and the head direction cells and the grid cells fire when they do fire is because every one of them has a complete copy of the cognitive map at the molecular level uh, inside the thing. And yes, they're reading the chart. And when you say, well, where is the chart that they're reading? It isn't out there in the cloud. It isn't out there in some hazily specified set of synapses. It's at the molecular level inside the neuron, as is the machinery for reading the chart. So the take-home message, memory is the foundation of cognition. Take away memory and the mind is gone. Culture is gone. Everything is gone. As you get to be my age, you become very aware of that brutal fact. Uh, why is it so important? Because it enables the unbounded composition of functions. Uh, since it's so important, neuroscientists won't find the engram until they adopt the cognitive science conception of memory and they look for it at the molecular level inside neurons. For reasons I hope are clear, uh, if I'm right, I realize that's a very big if, but if I'm right, <laughs> if it really is inside the neurons, if it, the brain really has the architecture of the internet, then the conceptual foundation, if you read the equivalent of Kandel and Schwartz 50 years from now, there won't be any resemblance between what you're reading there and, uh, and what you're reading now because neuroscience will rest on entirely different foundations because the, mem the brain is a computing machine and the foundation of computing machines is memory. Memory is as important to computation as DNA is to life. And so that will require a new synthesis and thank you for listening to it. Uh.